Imagine your worst crypto nightmare, losing control of your private keys and watching as tokens, NFTs, and whatever else is in there is simply removed. And not by one person, but by 50. And now imagine that you did this deliberately. What kind of madman voluntarily gives up their private keys, exposing themselves to the crypto jackals? Well, I'll tell you, this guy. That's right, me. I did it, and it was intense. But why? Why would I do something like that? Well, that is why you're watching this video, right? This is The Defiant. Question, did you watch last week's video about NFTs and crypto art? If so, did you realize that hidden in the film was my own personal manifesto about what I think digital art could or should be, and that there was an invitation literally embedded within it to join an NFT art experiment? No? Well, let me show you what was actually going on. This week, it's art. Let's pick it apart, put the horse before the cart. Think you're smart? Think you're smart. I find myself constantly interrogating my own work. What is art? Art is something that hits deeply home to things that I care about immensely. The value of creative endeavor. NFTs though, it's just a JPEG. Is it all actually just a bunch of <laughs> That humanity of real art is the thing that digital art will never be able to replicate. I hope other contemporary artists will take a look at the NFT space, not just for its radical creative potential. Robness, since being kicked off the platform, has launched a tokenized art experiment called Trash. I'm gonna do what I do best and turn the camera on myself. Yes, I made some NFTs. I consider myself a filmmaker. I've never been comfortable with calling myself an artist because I don't consider what I do art. I just have too much respect for the art of art itself. And maybe I shouldn't, maybe I should just focus on what I consider great art, which is much more than the raw materials or the pure execution, it's the story. How did it make you feel? It's the philosophy. And it's what I like to call the f factor. Surely the skill actually lies in identifying artists of promise and investing in them early. Trevor is, to be fair, a bit of a legend, and he was experimenting with QR codes as painting. And, and you know, sometimes art is right there in front of you. It's in the cues and the R's. I want to provoke you, to challenge you, to question your own moral compass. And I want to do it without you realizing I'm doing it. Digital art is just art. Just ask yourself how it makes you feel. Now that QR code on the wall wasn't real. That was CG. But the code itself, well, that was real. Later in the film, I talked about Trevor Jones and his QR code paintings. Well, here was my own. And yes, it could be scanned. So this is how the film began. Digital art. It's divisive, it's provocative, and now it's highly profitable. But can there really be art hiding behind something as meaningless as a simple QR code? Or is it a cruel experiment designed to teach us the meaning of greed? All of that coming up. So, that QR code took you to a website, and this is that website, and it says, Supermassive and Meme present Rug Pull Game of Chance. And there was a quote from Gordon Gecko: Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Very famous quote. And then there were two options, yes, let me in, which would take you to a Telegram group, and then no thanks. If you clicked on no thanks, here's what you got. It was actually the trailer to the film Margin Call. You're selling something that you know has no value. So that we may survive. You're selling something that you know has no value so that we may survive. Well, that's not what we were doing, in fact, but it was kind of a nice trigger. So if you clicked on Yes, Let Me In, you'll be taken to the rug pool telegram group. And that is where the rabbit hole opened up. That was really bad. I have different games. I even have one that could help make you smarter. In the last film, I mentioned that my buddy Simon and I had been arguing for weeks about whether all this digital art and NFT stuff was just BS. 
And whether the crypto part was all anyone actually cared about and the art was like, well, whatever. What is the difference between that and a digital print? Where is the value? So we cooked up this experiment to explore that very question. When people joined the Telegram group, they were asked, are you greedy or are you cultured? And this single question guided everything else that happened in the following seven days. Now, I think it's safe to say that in crypto, greed probably drives more decision-making than anything else, but the challenge we set ourselves was to create conditions in which culture would be worth more than greed or personal gain. So here's how we did it. Over the course of seven days, the members of the group were presented with video messages, clues, and tasks that forced them to confront their own moral compass and challenge their own value system. And ask yourself, am I greedy or am I cultured? And there were two important rules. Firstly, everyone had to know that they were in an experiment. And secondly, the only person who could lose money was me. And if anyone else came out of this lighter of wallet, it was because their conscience was signing the checks. Nobody was being asked to pay for anything. Nobody was doing anything other than taking part in a fun game that they'd found out about because they were smart. And the experiment was entitled The Rug Pool, one of the defining memes of the yield farming craze in 2020. It's that moment when liquidity is suddenly drained and everyone left in is now broke. Take this hot dog chart, for instance. Now that feels horrible. So by calling the experiment The Rug Pull, we were signaling that rug pulling would happen and people should expect it. Now, rug pulls are not unique to yield farming. They're not unique to trading in general. And as I realized while doing this, they are a fundamental building block of the human experience and one with immense value. That's that. What? Oh, God! God! A rug pull describes the moment when a set of expectations are discovered to be false and we're forced to adapt to a new reality at uncomfortable speed. The legendary screenwriting coach Robert McKee runs a three-day workshop called Story. It's the story where he repeatedly rams home the most important job for screenwriters when writing scenes. Now, a character goes into a scene with an objective, is then frustrated in the pursuit of that objective, and is forced to adapt and regroup to go again. And he calls this the gap between expectation and result. And when characters are forced to struggle through this gap, they suffer. The world reacts more powerfully than they expected, reacts differently than they expected, uh, and, and the world certainly does not cooperate with them. The world, in fact, is antagonistic. And we as viewers empathize with them through the suffering. We feel for them through the suffering. That empathy, that feeling, that's what we're after here. And you ask yourself the question, what would happen that is honest and true to this moment that my character would not see coming. So, you know, I realize that I do this all the time in the films on this channel. I deliberately set up expectations in a certain direction only to pull the rug and yank you, the viewer, in a different direction. Get ready for NFT 3.0. I do it because I enjoy it. I do it because it makes it more fun. I do it because that's just storytelling. It's the story. So you never have time to settle, you're playing catch up. And I hope that that makes the videos more satisfying. Setups and payoffs, setups and payoffs. With the rug pull experiment, I knew I wanted to create an experience of a rug pull, that gap between expectation and result, because it would make the participants feel something primal and emotional. And yes, that has immense value for the art part. So the other thing I did was include classic film and TV elements into the narrative, just to kind of signal that this was a cinematic style experience. There was The Prisoner, where individualism and collectivism are key themes. 12 Angry Men, Sidney Lumet's debut film in which 12 jurors are forced to confront their own morals to achieve consensus. And most importantly of all, Hitchcock's bomb under the table theory, which can only really be explained by the great man himself. Four people are sitting around the table talking about baseball, whatever you like. Five minutes of it, very dull. Suddenly, a bomb goes off, blows the people to smithereens. What do the audience have? 10 seconds of shock. Now take the same scene, 
and tell the audience there is a bomb under that table and will go off in five minutes. Well, the whole emotion of the audience is totally different. So what I was making here was an experience that would use cinematic storytelling techniques to evoke the sensation of the rug pull. And using the bomb under the table technique, it might simply be the threat of the rug pull that was more powerful than the rug pull itself. Ask yourself, what scares you the most? The rug pull or the possibility of a rug pull? The permanent clench or the rapid release? So the first major event that happened was that participants were encouraged to fill in a Google form with their ETH address, and they would then be sent a special NFT called the Bomb Squad. The first 50 addresses on the form will receive an NFT. There are enough NFTs for the first 50 people who join the group to each receive one. This NFT contained an audio file of the Robert Hughes clip about art and feeling. The basic project of art is always to make the world whole and comprehensible, to restore it to us in all its glory and its occasional nastiness, not through argument, but through feeling. As well as a locked image of Hitchcock, his magnified head staring out at the viewer as if scrutinizing their every move. There was no limit to how many wallets you could register, so one participant could potentially take all of them. The idea being to see whether people would naturally play fair or whether they would be greedy, all of which seemed fun and jolly to everyone. And even though some missed out, everybody felt like they kind of got something cool. And that set us up beautifully for Friday, when I did something completely crazy. Welcome back. Did you learn something about yourselves? Maybe? Maybe not. Does it even matter? You are you, and probably very comfortable there. You will not be ashamed, nor should you be. So where next? What seed of an idea can be phrased to guide our way? In a court of law, 12 good men and true are selected to hear evidence and provide a verdict. They alone decide the outcome. A jury of upright, honest, trustworthy people and we call these people... In the 1960s, Dr. Zira Rasul conducted extensive mind control experiments on subjects designed to make them resistant to interrogation to keep even the dearest secrets safe. A sequence of words repeated over and over to unlock the mind wall. They called this neural facultative treatment. And now, come! Beautiful, crime, virtual, host. Okay, so ask yourself, if you watched that, would you have understood what you were looking at here? Well, it didn't take long for the group, tuned in as they were to look for clues, to guess that this might be a seed phrase. What seed of an idea can be phrase? They plugged it into MetaMask and there in front of them was a wallet, my wallet, with tokens and NFTs inside laid bare, unprotected. So what do you think happened? Well, nobody did anything. They left it exactly as it was. They didn't take a token. No, of course they did. Obviously, those tokens started leaving the wallet almost immediately. Well, not quite immediately. There was a moment where people weren't quite sure what to do with it. But then once it started happening, it went really fast. So there are lots of different reasons and references for this. I think I was primarily influenced by the KLF, who was an early 90s music and art group in the UK. They're justified and they're ancient. And they'd made a stack of money with top 10 singles. And they took a million quid and they burnt it. They just burnt it, got rid of it. And that's pretty primal, just burning money. Why? There was a lot of reasons why, and there's still a lot, we're still discovering reasons every day. We burnt it because we'd never be as talented as Michael Jackson. We could have done with the money. We wanted the money, but we wanted to burn it more. And so I guess that was sort of part of what I was thinking here. Uh, but I think the main thing was, 
what people's expectations were, were that they were going to get rug pulled, that at some point they were going to be the victims of the rug pull. But I flipped it. I cast them in the role of the rug pullers. I was the one that got rug pulled and I did it to myself, but I never said to anybody, go in and take my tokens. And this is a specific problem that we debated in the group. The private keys were exposed and I exposed them. So technically I was giving people the key to the wallet, which meant they could go and look in the wallet. Okay. But taking the tokens out, for me that crosses the line, that's stealing. But for others, well, you're playing the crypto game, so you should expect them to be taken. Because once you own the private key, you own the wallet. And I think it's a fair question. And I don't think there's a good answer to that. And the other thing is, this was a real wallet. I hadn't staged this wallet for the purposes of the experiment. And I had been really firm on myself to say, if I'm going to do this, it has to be a real thing. It has to have real significance to me. It has to be a sacrifice, if you like. It has to feel like it feels when you get genuinely rug pulled. I think it was just shocking for everyone. And for me in particular, it was, it's hard to describe. So that's it. I have sent the video and yeah, I'm naked. I'm, I'm exposed. This is it. I, I've just given my private keys to a stack of people and I don't know. That's great. It's nice to have an idea and have a theory and say, yeah, this, yeah, that's, we'll test it. It's going to be fine. But doing it now instantly, just a rush of regret, a rush of what was I thinking? but it's too late and I have to, I have to see this through now. I was exposed and I was just sitting on my hands going, this is horrible. And it genuinely was horrible that I volunteered myself. I deliberately given up what was around about $8,000 worth of tokens, which is not nothing. I'm trying to chronicle this whole process but there is this just horrible feeling in my stomach that I have, that I've just done something utterly stupid. Like how could I possibly know what the people in this group were gonna do? How could I possibly know how any of this was gonna play out? Like the moment you put money in play, it, people just act greedy, they act, they act irrationally. And I, I knew this was going to happen, but now every single fiber of my being is saying there was no need to do this. There was no, there was absolutely no, you didn't have to. And it just feels like I've just, just thrown it away, completely thrown it away. It's, but I guess that's the point. It's, it's to feel that. I thought I was stronger than this. I thought I could handle it, but it's not, it's not nice. It's not nice at all. I'd phrased it as a weekend experiment and people were saying, you know, <laughs> weekend experiment, this has taken 30 minutes and it's all done. But that wasn't the game. A bomb goes up, blows the people to smoke. What do the audience had? 10 seconds of shock. The game was, if people take all these tokens, could I, using pressure, storytelling, just different ways, could I pressure people into returning the money? I believe that over the course of 48 hours over that weekend, that's what would happen. Next morning I wake up and $49 in Dai had been sent to a return address that I'd specified. $49, that was it. And that didn't feel good. Okay, it's time for another update. It's the next morning. I really didn't sleep last night. There's just this sick feeling in my stomach just over and over and over. Here is my phone. I'm going to check now and see what has come back. Oh God, this is awful. Well, yeah. Well, that's, that's worse than I expected. So that's when 
I placed a bomb under that table. Congrats to everyone who relieved the open wallet of the funds inside. What you didn't know was that one of the members of this group is a white hat hacker. We tracked every single transaction that left the wallet. We know where it went, how it was used, and in many cases, the real identity of the owner. You may be wondering how we acquired this information. Well, remember the sign-up form for the original NFT drop? Only one of you correctly understood that this was a potential data mining trap. Now, this wasn't true. There was no white hat hacker. There was no data mining, no data scraping or anything. And what I was poking fun at was the fact that when people had signed up for the NFT, they'd just done it. They hadn't thought, well, what am I signing up for here? It's a Google form. They'd just willy-nilly thrown in their ETH addresses. And even though I hadn't asked them for anything, there was only one person in the group who said, you know what, I'm not giving you my data, but here's my ETH address, which I thought was telling. People just want free stuff. No surprise there. So what I was trying to do was say to this group, it's worth more to you to give the tokens back than to suffer the possibility that something bad might happen. Because I hadn't said it would happen, I just raised the specter that it could happen, and in so doing, placed a bomb under the table. The whole emotion of the audience is totally different. That night, a whole bunch of tokens, about $4,000 worth of tokens, returned. Okay, it's time for another update. It's Sunday morning. I saw there were some messages from the app. And we're going to have a look now. Oh, no way. So, wow. Okay. So I'm not an idiot. I, well, it's not all of them. But, yeah. That makes a big difference. Oh, my God. And suddenly in the group, you started to see this conversation going on, which was, we should give these tokens back. There was a counter narrative, which was, the expectations of this game were that the tokens should be taken. If anybody unlocked the code, they would expect this to be their prize. And my counter argument to this was, no, your prize was to open the wallet. It wasn't to take the tokens. And so what I was trying to do was so doubt, was to create an, an atmosphere in which I could pressure others into pressuring others. So even though in the public group there was a certain dialogue going on, I knew that in DMs there was a whole bunch of other conversations going on, all of which would surround, should I give it back? Do you know who took it? And it actually worked. Pretty much everything came back. So that on Sunday morning I looked at my wallet and all but pretty much one token had come back. The problem was that one token represented the largest single theft, around about $4,000. At that point, I started to get worried. I started to think, well, maybe people are not going to give these back. And then it went on through Sunday. And so I started layering on a bit more pressure because I realized that there was a chance that whoever had taken these was not actively participating in the group and had deliberately distanced themselves. Come Monday morning, still nothing. So I placed one more level of pressure on, which is there was a prize for completing this task, for returning all the tokens. If the tokens are not returned by the deadline, then there is no prize, nobody gets anything. And I kind of hinted at the value of the prize and what it would be. So that was my last card I could play. Didn't work. I had made a bet on humanity, I'd made a bet on my own ability to create a narrative and a set of pressures that would end up in the right result. And I lost. It felt bad, I'll be honest. And I realized that those ghost tokens, they weren't coming back. And no matter what I did, they wouldn't be coming back. And we sort of figured out why it was. And it was because someone in the group had spoken to someone external to the group about the seed phrase and what it meant. And that person had then gone into the wallet and taken the tokens. So that person wasn't in the game, hadn't been brought through the stages of the game. And so they weren't subject to the same pressures or the same ramping up of pressures that I'd designed previously. So I had no influence over them. That's when I called time on the experiment, at least kind of publicly anyway. So you've chosen greed and the experiment ends. At the end of the day, it only takes one person to act against the group 
for everything to come crashing down. Thank you for participating. I think it's fair to say that the whole group felt pretty confused by the whole thing and they, they really want to understand what it was all about. And it comes down to this. For me, art is about an experience, about a feeling. And when you see a JPEG or a GIF, the experience of owning the NFT version of that is essentially no different to owning the copy. You can view it on the same screen and in the same way. And when I explain NFTs to people now, yeah, the provable scarcity part is important, but I now find myself calling them tokens with a timeline. They have a history and they carry that history with them. Fungible tokens also have a timeline, but it's a price timeline. It's external to themselves, but NFTs contain a unique timeline all to themselves. Now, I work with timelines every day. It's my bread and butter. You're watching a timeline right now. And I use it to build experiences through storytelling in a time-based media. So the problem I've always had with NFTs and digital art represented as NFTs is that they just don't really go far enough in exploiting the very specific qualities and conditions unique to blockchain. It's superficial. The challenge I set myself was to design an art piece that did, that could only live on blockchain. One that framed a question that demanded the art component to be weighed seriously against the blockchain component. And so I did. But this experiment, well, that was not the art piece, but it was part of it. It was a test in production. Andre would be proud. It was a blood sacrifice, if you will, not just to validate the ideas, but also to validate myself and Simon as crypto artists worth investing in. So let me now lift the lid on the real rug pull. It looks like this. We will be holding an auction of 12 NFTs, which will take place on the meme coin platform. These NFTs feature an original artwork created by Simon One. How do I get that on the blockchain? How do I become a token? The NFTs will be displayed as an ongoing and continual public art installation on the meme coin website. And this is important because there are not one, but two different versions of the artwork. And which one is displayed in the installation has a radical impact on the value of the NFT itself. Because you see, 11 of the NFTs will be identical, but one will be different. Because that one contains access instructions to a wallet containing exactly one Bitcoin. NFTs can be programmed with a locked file, which will tell the owner whether or not their NFT contains the Bitcoin. And the owner is free to access this information at any time, but doing so will instantly trigger the public installation to reflect that the secret has been revealed. And if the owner of the NFT containing the Bitcoin reveals their secret, then the status of all the other NFTs is instantly changed. Is it worth more to leave them untouched and not know whether they contain the Bitcoin or take the risk of not having a Bitcoin and open it? And how high does the value of Bitcoin have to go for you to be seriously tempted to take a peek inside that locked file? If someone did decide to take the risk and open the locked file and reveal the status of their art piece, if it doesn't contain the Bitcoin, then suddenly that NFT is worth well, very, very little, but it means the value of the other NFTs goes up. So as a group, 12 NFT owners, it's worth so much more to not reveal which one has the Bitcoin in. The collection is worth more. And as a result, the art, because the art isn't just the actual art piece, it's the entire installation, it's the entire concept, is worth more than the Bitcoin. But how does that relate to the price of Bitcoin? Let's say it goes to six figures. Then suddenly you've got something that has quite a lot of value. What would the temptation be like to peek inside? What's it worth? You know, and the thing is, it's very easy for people to say, well, I wouldn't be greedy. And in the group, when we tested it this week, people said, I, I wouldn't be greedy. But then they were greedy. When the door is slightly open, somebody will walk through it, guaranteed. If the person whose NFT does contain the Bitcoin, happens to be the one that peeks inside, then that breaks all the other ones. So suddenly, all of their NFTs are worth nothing. And that's why it's called the rug pull. At any moment, any one of those 12 could decide to look inside and break the whole thing for everybody else. That's the risk. 
So that is the real main event art piece. Mine and Simon's attempt to frame a genuine question. What is more valuable, a piece of art or the crypto it contains? And force it to bring owners together to help shape the value of the art, together in partnership with the artist, reducing the risk of the rug pull, but always tracking the value of the Bitcoin itself, day by day, second by second. And that is the experience I wanted to build, the bomb under the table, the one that puts the art first, but one that is changing every second. Every token you buy, every project you support in the space ends up being subject to one overriding principle. Bitcoin is king. Bitcoin rules everything. And we're all at the mercy of the Satoshi juggernaut, which creates immense pressure. In 12 Angry Men, it's the one dissenting voice in the shape of Henry Fonda's juror number eight that speaks up for what is right. It's uncomfortable. He's resented by the others and placed under immense pressure, but ultimately, it's what brings about the right outcome. Guilty, pal. It's as plain as the nose on your face. So why don't we stop wasting our time here? We're gonna all get sore throats if we keep it up, you know? What difference does it make if you get it here at the ball game? Now, it's no coincidence that there are 12 NFTs for sale. The power and weight of that embedded Bitcoin will be hard to resist. But I wanted to ensure that I had my own Jura number eight in the group to push for the right outcome, for the art, to act against greed. Now that was the true purpose of the experiment, to create a select group of curators who would look after the interests of the project and be that dissenting voice if one was needed. And that is a brand new form of digital curatorship. That was what this was all about. Now there's an important point here which is about curatorship and audience. Ever since you walked into this room, you've been acting like a self-appointed public avenger. You want to see this boy die because you personally want it, not because of the facts. You're a sadist. So that is why I gave 50 strangers my private keys. That small community shared a unique experience and learned to value the art above the tokens. And in return for everything that they did, one of the 12 NFTs will be for them to bid on and for them to bid on only. And maybe they'll form a collective to purchase it. And maybe they'll shard it using Niftex so that everyone can benefit. But they should be the strongest advocates for its artistic qualities when the price of Bitcoin starts to rise. Because what I worry is that when there's a valuable piece of art, only those with deep enough pockets to purchase will purchase. Jason Williams and I are making a big bet on digital art. And then it's out of reach and then we have the same debate about art and elitism, which is what we wanted to avoid here. And yeah, you know where the funds for that hidden Bitcoin is coming from? Yep, from the tokens that were taken. So the experiment really will be baked into the main art piece. Now look, I don't know whether any of this will ultimately mean anything, but I just had to do it. The art I appreciate the most is from artists that take risks, that follow their instincts, and strive to go and bridge that gap from meaning to feeling. Digital art. It's divisive, it's provocative, and now it's highly profitable. But can there really be art hiding behind something as meaningless as a simple QR code? Or is it a cruel experiment designed to teach us the meaning of greed? You stole fizzy lifting drinks. You bumped into the ceiling, which now has to be washed and sterilized, so you get Nothing! You lose! Now that auction is coming soon, and if you're interested in the Bomb Squad NFT, I'll leave a link in the description below. This, well, it's been emotional, it's been tough, but so worth it. Thanks for watching.